Um, our next uh, contributor is um, a train of imams. And without much ado, I'd like to ask uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, who is the dean for the Muslim Theological College from Cambridge. Most of us know Sheikh Abdul Hakim as an academic, as a philosopher, as an intellectual. But perhaps we don't know that he is running a Muslim uh, college for the training of imams in Cambridge. Sheikh Abdul Hakim. Bismillahi Rahmani Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Wa Salatu Wa Salamu Ala Sayyidil Anbiya Iwal Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammadin Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Ajma'in. Given the, uh, the label under which this uh, event is taking place, it's perhaps useful to uh, consider this a time to take stock. Ten years have passed since the uh, 11th of September uh, moment, and it's as good a time as any to see what has worked and what has not worked. What things have happened that are positive and what things have happened that have uh, dragged us further into confusion and turmoil. One thing that I think after these 10 years we're all clear about is that uh, the conventional remedies proposed by the existing international structures have been challenged to and beyond breaking point by what was an event which was completely outside their frame of reference. The solution to global Islamist terror that has been proposed has been essentially to do with uh, coercive measures, increased surveillance, uh, novel and uh, sometimes unusual forms of detention and interrogation and a global atmosphere of suspicion and in some parts of the West now almost paranoia about the very fact that Muslims exist at all. On its own terms, that agenda hasn't demonstrably succeeded. Are we less at risk of a similar event now than we were 10 years ago? Not sure. Are things going well in Afghanistan? Not really. Are those people finally browbeaten, never to return? Unclear. It is considering that several trillion dollars, and I don't know how many pounds, has been spent on it, not a terribly successful outcome. Those of us who, in this little corner of the Ummah, are called upon to play their part need to bear that in mind. In a secular age, there tends to be an assumption that only secular solutions can solve all problems, even religious problems. The current failure of the secular solutions indicates that that is just another part of the Enlightenment's hubris. In fact, they've tried, and they've thought very hard, and they've used their truly gigantic resources, but still they can't cope with the situation which is before them, and there's no clear sign that they even understand its nature. Uh, despite the formidable nature of the tools in their toolbox, uh, they cannot deal with what is, in essence, an aberration within a major world religion that is outside the compass of their abilities. They show an ability on occasion to inflame things and make matters worse. But to make matters better, it's not clear that we can expect them to do that. That's not what they were elected for not what they were trained for, it's really outside their framework. The problem is spiritual, it is emotive, it is theological, doctrinal, and they simply do not do that. There can be a danger that we get caught up in the slipstream of that enormous global industry, counter-radicalization. And since it's not clear at all that that industry has delivered on its own terms, we are within our rights to step aside and to furrow our brows and to think carefully and perhaps reproachfully about whether we should be on board. It is, after all, our responsibility as people who claim to represent the world religion in question to deal with the aberrations in that religion. The outside forces have, in many cases, exacerbated things. And that goes back at least 100 years, the Balfour Declaration, allowing the Saudis to occupy Mecca and Medina, the mob bombardment of Alexandria in um, 
1882, other events like that, the destruction of the institution of the Sheikh al-Islam, all of these institutions have been body blows to the traditional equilibrium, which made Sunni Islam for so many centuries actually extremely calm, uh, almost somnolent. The Victorian image of Sunni Islam has sunk in oriental repose. Nothing ever happened in the Muslim world. It was quiet, fatalistic, accepting the decree of heaven. That stereotype has been rocked because of the extraordinary uh, earthquakes that have shaken the foundation of the metabolism of Sunni Islam. Nonetheless, it is our responsibility, independently of the wishes of others, to engage in healing the wound within our tradition. And the first thing that we need to say to those who say we should be doing more, it's the responsibility of British imams to be sorting the problem of radicalization, is to point out that Islam does not function as Christianity does in terms of the administration of sacraments and a parish system. The imam has no automatic authority. A Catholic priest, if you approach the altar to receive the sacraments and you're married to a divorcee, can send you away. You can be excommunicated. You need him for salvation. The imam has no comparable authority. He can't stop anybody attending the mosque. So to ask us to sort the problem is to assume that the traditional crisis management, which the British state is familiar with in terms of the default Christianity of these islands, applies to Islam as well. And in practice, it simply doesn't. We don't have that kind of power of excommunication or exclusion. Another thing to remember when we are being asked to deal with this problem is that we are being asked to deal with the local version of something that is truly global. Uh, it's a little bit like somebody who is afflicted with eczema. He has eczema in many parts of his body. And a doctor is told, keep one hand completely clear of the eczema. And we British Muslims are being told, keep our region free of this disorder. In fact, the doctor can't do that because the sickness is part of the metabolism. It's an allergy born of a deep uh, trauma or uh, inability of the metabolism to assimilate certain poisons that is going to affect all parts of it, irrespective of how much the doctors may concentrate and spend time and treasure healing a particular part. The crisis is ummah-wide, and British Islam is not going to be spared its consequences until globally it is resolved. Another issue, it seems to me, is that the problem in terms of explaining what is wrong for those who are engaged in counter-radicalization is a simple one. This is not the kind of intricate arguments required to persuade a Mu'tazilite that the Qur'an is uncreated. The debates over the legitimate use of force in Islam were resolved a long time ago under the subject of ijma and are supported by very powerful Quranic and Hadith dalils. And as the ulama overwhelmingly rejected the khawarij, the analogous uh, forms of Islam have been comparably refuted very successfully uh, since then. It's one of the easier errors in the possible spectrum of errors in our heritage to overcome. It shouldn't actually take more than five minutes. A real scholar confronting one of these young zealots, it should really take him about two or three minutes in order to present the argument in a way that really is irrefutable. The problem is, 10 years on, the argument is still not getting through. Uh, the reason for that, I suspect, is that uh, the young are, as is very often in our modern personality-oriented culture, focused on who is speaking more than on the content of the arguments. They want to see who is behind the particular discourse. And one thing that has made it far harder for us to make this very simple case against the suicide bombers, against the mass murderers, against the torturers and the other roulette in our community is that the mainstream discourse has to some extent been hijacked. Just as Islam has been hijacked internationally by the lunatic fringe, so the mainstream discourse has often been hijacked by regimes and agencies of various kinds that use the moderating agenda for their own purposes. 
it's very difficult. And if you read the testimonies of some of the Egyptian radicals from the uh, jihad uh, formations uh, who have been turned and have returned to the straight and narrow, you see how difficult it is for them really to listen to the Azhari sheikhs when the Azhari sheikhs are talking to them in the prison and in the cell next door, somebody just like them is having his fingernails pulled out. It's very difficult if the sheikhs are suborned by a state that is identified with cruelty for the sheikhs to be taken as seriously as they ought to be. Many of them are seen as having allowed themselves to be part of somebody's security agenda, to be the representatives of cruelty, corruption, nepotism, and the other traits which, as we all know, as the demonstrators across the Arab world at the, at the moment know, are endemic in every Muslim country. So there is a crisis in the ulama. We know the arguments, but we ourselves are not always a sufficiently convincing argument. And this is a more profound crisis, a crisis in the credibility of the scholars, which sounds like a Ghazalian type of crisis. We have been uh, led astray by the desire to please principles, formations which are extraneous to our only <laughs> legitimate loyalty, which is pleasing Allah and his messenger. Part of the problem also is the fact that with the nationalization of the awqaf in the great majority of Muslim countries, training scholars of the very highest level has become something that is extremely difficult to separate from various state-based manipulations of the ijtihad process. Sheikh Mustafa Sabri, Allah Yirhamu, used to say that the thing he most feared uh, for the region was after the nationalization of the Ottoman Awqaf in the uh, 19th century, was the fact that the really great madrasas, the places that produced really new, interesting ijtihad thinking, were now part of the state bureaucracy. They were part of um, the Awqaf, they were part of the Ministry of Education, and the state was pushing along the arguments rather than the ulama being independently financed and coming to the arguments which on the basis of taqwa and the usul alone had credibility. So this also has been a fear. The fear that the institutions as well as the representatives of the mainstream are simply not credible to the, the wild men. Otherwise, how could we explain this embarrassing fact that our hujjahs are not convincing, that they listen to us but they are incredulous and instead follow interpretations which are wild and strange. That they see the detailed fatwas of the ulama and instead of following them, they follow the strange fatwas of bin Laden and if you've read his stuff, you'll see they don't even look like fatwas at all. It's just a list of grievances followed by the statement, so we have to go and kill their civilians. That effectively is all they are. But still some young people, not stupid young people, prefer that to the fatwas of the ulama. So there is a crisis of legitimacy amongst Muslim leaders, which means that we have to strain every nerve to avoid being seen as contaminated by connection to the powers that be. However absurd and silly that might sometimes seem, it is necessary, because what those powers administer is the kiss of death. If you go into a prison and the government is encouraging you to de-radicalize people, it will be a thousand times harder for you to succeed in that praiseworthy end than if you're independent and can prove that you're independent and you're doing the same thing. It's sad, but it's true. So one of the things that we have to think about as a community is how to disengage with well-meaning but unsuccessful official initiatives. Politicians, Whitehall desk pilots, social administrators, security men and others who wish entirely rightly to overcome the scourge of radicalism, but don't really understand the problem and don't really have the right kind of tools, and who are associated in the eyes of the young and angry with foreign policies that those young and angry men find abhorrent. We have to find ways of disengagement and detachment, because this is, after all, the way of the ulama. And as we've just heard, the way of the ulama in the early times was Ahmad bin Hanbal was flogged, uh, Imam Malik had his arms dislocated. This was the way of the ulama. They would not go along with the powers that be. And ultimately, everybody benefits from the independence of the ulama, because what the ulama want is only al-khayr lil-ibad, is good for Allah's servants. 
what we wish to see in the world is not so different to what the international consensus, broadly speaking, wishes to see, because the maqasid of the sharia, human beings having the right to life, to honor, to property, to marriage, to religion, uh, those are basic rights which just about everybody acknowledges. We're not advocating some strange moral randomness. We are advocating universal principles. In many details, we disagree with the current set of values uh, espoused by the emerging global culture. That's too bad, and hopefully, in their more intelligent moments, they will recognize how beneficial it is for there to be more than one opinion on social and moral and political subjects uh, in the earth. Um, they don't always recognize that, but we can, I think, be proud of our role as leaven in the dough, as creating a constructive dissidence in a world in which the discourse seems to be increasingly monolithic. So that has to be our responsibility, to try and overcome the current state of failure, failure of international institutions, uh, and also the failure of the ulama to come up with successful strategies for dealing with these people. Uh, we can reach further into the shadows than uh, the states can, because we speak the same language. We don't go around talking about social cohesion and equalities and citizenship and those buzzwords, we use our own vocabulary. When we use our own vocabulary, then we can start to do the work. To the extent that we use social science jargon, we are immediately labeled as irrelevant cat's paws of a hostile establishment and our words will simply harden rather than soften our hearts. We have to use the internal discourse of the religion rather than the current jargon of um, the current generation of fashionable social science. That, again, seems to be evident. It has to be, our discourse has to be legitimate. When we found that discourse, then perhaps we can start to be heard. And one of the ways in which the mosques are often bullied, I think, especially by journalists, is why aren't you doing more to engage with the radicals? The radicals are not in the mosques, in my experience. Um, the radicals are out there somewhere in their own little uh, para-mosque communities, they hire halls, they meet in houses, sports halls, they're not generally in the mosques. We don't reach them with khutbas or with anything that we do or can do, but we have to find ways of establishing some sort of credibility in their eyes. Independence has to be one of those ways, sincerity has to be one of those ways, concern with international Muslim political issues has to be one of those ways, uh, and we have to reach those people through showing that we understand their pain, their situation, their marginalization, their humanity, rather than treating them as some kind of uh, infection that has to be extirpated. The dehumanizing of the radical is one of the most dangerous and provocative aspects of the current international hysteria. So those are essentially the things that I wanted to say. And I think that after 10 years, most of us know these things already. And I apologize for saying what is obvious. We need to be detached. We need to be authentically Islamic. We need to have only the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in view in all of these things that we do. And we need to recognize the humanity of these people. Remember that in the hadith of Dhul Khawaisira, when the man who'd abused the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Bani Tamim and he abused him after the Ghazwat Hunayn turned away, Sidna Omar said, shall we kill him? And the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, no. And it was the same with Imam Ali. Bal min al-kufri harabu. Those people have run away from kufr. We don't reciprocate their takfir with another takfir. Instead, we acknowledge them as erring brothers. And we listen to them. We try and experience their pain. And if, for the first time, they experience somebody actually empathizing with them, hearing them rather than just pushing them away, treating them as an infection, then we will start to reach them, because this is an error, not a doctrinal. As I said, the doctrinal fifty issues easily resolved. This is a, a sickness which is in the heart. And unless we can reach out to them and include them and embrace them and use authentic Islamic adab and vocabulary with them, we'll just push them further out into the shadows and the current uh, stalemate, which is catastrophic for the Muslim community and for the world at large, is likely to continue. Anyway, barakallahu feekum. I'm sorry to have taken so long because I know that you didn't come here to listen to me. But alhamdulillah, al-afu minkum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.